Good morning. In the studio with me today is Brenda Smith. She's an RN and a coordinator, educating coordinator for uh, Centera. Um, Brenda is here today to talk to us about the LVAD, and I'll let her explain what that is to you. Um, also with me today in the studio is Debbie Brenneman from EMS. I want to just give you a few pointers and some techniques on what these, what this device is, and what you, how you might see it in the field when you come across it. What exactly is an LVAD? <laughs> <laughs> what we have here today is the HeartMate 2. An LVAD is a left ventricular assist device, and what that does, it hooks to a po patient's heart and supports that heart. It kind of takes over the work of the left ventricle, which does all the pumping action of the blood throughout the body. You'll hear some of the physicians say they're putting in an artificial heart, but that's not what this is. This is actually a support for a person's own heart. So their heart is still intact in their chest. This is a support device. Yes. Okay. So what this, the way this goes in the patient's heart is this part, which is the inflow cannula, hooks to the bottom part of the heart, the apex of the left ventricle, the pump sits in the abdomen. The surgeon actually makes a little pocket for this pump to sit in. And then the outflow cannula underneath the sternum to the ascending aorta, which does the pumping through the rest of the body. Then the drive line, which is really the lifeline for these patients, is tunneled through the abdominal area, comes out the left-hand side, and this is hooked to power. So that's key words for anyone, whether it's support people, the patient, EMS, first responders, um, the hospital staff, power, 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 power. This has to be hooked to power. Okay. Now once the, once the LVAD is implanted in the patient, um, it's not going to be easy for us to see. How are we going to know a patient, if they're up and functioning, has an LVAD in place? Well, one thing, um, support, support staff. Now, it could be um, the patient's wife, husband. They are truly the experts once we send these patients home to the community. They've been trained. They've been through multiple training sessions. They've been tested. So if that support person is there, they're going to be the ones to talk to to say, this is what's going on. This is what the patient has. This is the type of that the patient has. If they're alone, which these patients now are independent, they are driving out there. They could be behind you in Walmart, out to theater, out to dinner and they actually have a singable episode and they're alone, then you're going to, once you see that person down, you're going to see a bag, whether it be this type of bag with their controller and batteries in it, or they could have a fanny pack. And then also look, if you see those things, look for a drive line. Look for something coming out the left or the right side that looks like this, okay. that's hooked to batteries and a controller. Okay. Now with the LVAD, you had spoken earlier that the patient's not going to have a pulse with it. Right. So if we come on scene, we should immediately assess if the patient doesn't have a pulse, do they have the drive line coming out? Right. Because exactly. CPR would be a, a, a disaster yeah. at that point in time. Because more than likely, especially with the younger population of patients, they're, the reason they're down is dehydration. This pump is very preload dependent and afterload sensitive. So it has to have that volume going into this inflow to push through the pump to go to the rest of the body. So if they go home and they're not drinking enough and they're dehydrated, which most of them are when they first go home, then that person could just have that sinkable episode for nothing other than being dehydrated. Other than the tube coming out of their, the side of their body, do they wear medic alert tags? Is, is there something that would alert us that they have an LVAD? We encourage a medic alert tags, but of course there's a charge to them. Thoratec um, now has made one and probably by the end of August we will have one distributed to each of our patients that will say what type of device they have and the phone numbers for each center. They have cards, little cards that go with their bags and I actually give them about 10 cards when they go home and say plant them everywhere. Plant them in your car, plant them in your bag, plant them in your extra bag that they all have to take around with them so that they've got the center that they come from, name, emergency number, what kind of VAD that they have, when it was implanted, and their physicians. So that should be somewhere on the patient. And that's a huge resource for anybody that comes in contact with this yes. kind of patient. That's yes. our resource connection yes. to yes. how to take yeah. care of them. Dial the number. Exactly. Okay. So we come up upon this patient, and this patient's had a syncopal episode, and they're now unconscious, and they don't have a pulse. And we identify that the person has an LVAD in place, so we're at least ahead of the game there. The game there. Um, how do we know whether the device is working, and that's the reason they don't have a pulse, or that everything's just shut down? 
the controller itself has a series of alarms. So if that red heart alarm is actually loud sounding, beeping, and flashing, then that is a hazard alarm. That alarm is telling you either low flow, where their flow is less than 2.5 liters, something's disconnected, drive line's loose, disconnected, a wire's fractured in that drive line, or the pump is stopped. So what you want to do is look, of course, for the most obvious connections, make sure they're tight, uh, make sure the drive line, which goes into the side here, is connected and going in and not hanging out or hanging loose. Look at the drive line itself to make sure there's no, and you can feel along the outside of this, and there's six wires inside. So you would be able to tell if you could feel a crack or something that's cracked inside the drive line. The other thing would be to hook them to, if you, especially if they're home, hooked into their power base unit okay. with a screen. The screen will tell you pump stopped, low flow. It's going to tell you what that alarm is so that you can go from there. Okay. Now, assuming that it's not alarming, so everything's functioning and the person just was dehydrated and passed out, is there anything we're going to be able to hear to know that it's still functioning? Can we listen anywhere? Yes. You're going to take your stethoscope, listen right at the pocket underneath the heart so area. in the left? Left upper quadrant. Okay. And you're going to hear a high-pitched whirling sound. Is this pocket in their in their in their abdomen? Is this visible, similar to what a pacemaker might look like under your skin? Can we see where this Not is? Not normally. Um, if it's a very very thin patient, you might be able to. I do have one patient that his pump, for whatever reason, is sitting very anteriorly, and you could actually put your hand around it. But general population of patients, no, you will not be able to see where it is. But there's a scar or something there, there that's going to identify. The scar is a median sternotomy scar, just like bypass surgery, valve surgery. So, so it's here. It may take us a second to actually, actually get to where that sound right, is. Okay. Right. But if you go to where you know the heart, the left ventricle of the heart is, and just go down a little bit, you'll be able to hear it. Okay. Now, other than the person having a syncopal episode, which hopefully they'll recover from, by, by the time that we get on scene and they'll be able to tell us that, yes, they have a bad in place and, and this is what we need to do to help them, um, you had talked about earlier about the patient having possibly dysrhythmias. Um, what do we need to worry about? Will this, will the VAD continue to function if the person's in a, a dysrhythmia? It will. Um, and that's the beauty of the VAD. These patients can be in VTAC, VFib, and still have the fad that's working, so they're alert, they're talking to you. So I'm, they have no shortness of We'll breath. have a VTAC, VFib patient with yours. no pulse yes. talking to me. Talking to you. And, yes. <laughs> and we will call you immediately of on course. that number and you will that's tell good. us what we're to do. Yes, exactly. Now ACLS, BLS is going to be all the same up to the point of the CPR because of where this VAD okay. sits. If the arrhythmia is sustained over a period of time, then it's going to eventually affect the volume status going into the pump, the preload. Once it affects preload, then you're going to have alarms that are going to start to go off. You're going to have the patient that may then become syncopal, and you would have to either cardiovert or defib. Okay. Do you recommend that prior to cardioverting, because will that take several minutes for that to happen, for yes, us to will. call you and say, okay, this is what we have, and this is what alarms are showing, and this is the rhythm we're showing. Right. So what do you recommend for exactly. us to do? Yeah, get on the phone with us to that emergency number. You will have a physician to talk to. And that's a 24-7 24 24 7 number. Answering. Okay, very, very good. We like that. But with regard to cardioversion or shock therapy, uh, uh, defibrillation, not over, the, not over the pump? Not over the pump. So you would, you know, position your EKG leads so that they're not there. Also, do not disconnect anything. Do not disconnect drive line, batteries, or if you're hooked to the power base unit, do not disconnect electrical power to do the defibrillation or the cardioversion. Because that stops That's effectively that stops the heart the from pump. pumping. Yes. Okay. And with regard to CPR, we have a mannequin here. Is there a special hand placement if we were going to do CPR? Yes, there is. And you at know? what point would we do CPR? Only when they become symptomatic? When, if this pump is stopped. So if we don't hear the whir. You don't hear the whirling of the pump, and we've gone through all the process. We've changed out batteries, or we've hooked to the power base unit. We've changed out the controller to their backup controller to make sure it's not a controller issue. So we've done everything possible as far as that equipment issues. You're on the phone with us, and we're saying, pump stopped, initiate CPR. Okay. So in your mind's eye, you have to remember where the pump is situated. So bottom part of the left ventricle, 
pocket here. Sternum has the cannula, and this cannula is not like steel. No, it actually feels see. like tissue paper. Yes. It feels so very you fragile. you don't want to dislodge the cannula. So you would go off and upward, so you want to stay away from the pump area. So just off the center of the sternum, just a little bit to the left. And, and what you're left. Patient's left, and what you're doing essentially is priming this pump to keep the forward flow of blood through the pump itself. If the pump is stopped, then it's going to immediately have retrograde flow back through the pump through that cannula. And if it's stopped and it's not going forward, then clots, thrombus, will quickly start up in the cannulas and in the pump itself. So that's what we're doing. We're just making sure that we've got some forward flow going through this way and then of course get them to the hospital. And at any point during CPR are you going to hear the whirling start again? No. No. You so we would continue not. doing you would CPR. Just continue because we've done everything we can do as far as the pump itself. Okay, so off offset a little bit from the sternum making sure we're away from that. Right. And the other th thing that you mentioned was not as deep as we're taught yes, to do just, CPR. You know, just just enough. enough to get that pump right. flowing. But with the CPR, just to reiterate, I shouldn't be starting CPR on a VAD patient before before I'm contacting you for right. you to help me troubleshoot, troubleshoot all the connectors, all the controllers, all everything. the batteries, everything yes. else that could have possibly be fixed. And this have. is a latch stitch effort because the pump is just not working. working. Exactly. Okay. And to reiterate that as to how important that is, if you do CPR on an LVAD patient, certainly we want you to give them every opportunity to survive, but there are complications with doing CPR with this, and it is to dislodge the pump, which is a direct line, so now you have a patient who's bleeding out. Right, right. Okay. So, I mean, the quicker you can get them to us, the better off the patient will be. Okay. Because at the hospital, we have all the equipment that we can visually look at what might have happened with the patient. We might have to open the chest and go ahead and replace the pump. Um, we need to start a heparin drip because once the pump stops, depending on what their coagulation status is when, they, when this happens, then thrombus could form quickly. Or if their INRs are three or better, then maybe it's going to take a little bit of time. Um, with regard to the pumps, there are a lot of these in the area here in Virginia Beach locally, but this is a nationwide and international thing. So there are a lot of patients all over the place. Exactly. And people travel and have normal lives with these things. So yes. they, they may or may not be in your area, but they may travel to your area. Right. There are places everywhere that you can contact? They, yes. Whatever we, the number is, contact that number. We have a um, database with all the VAD centers and the coordinators and physicians connected to those centers so that we're able to help with getting you connected to whatever center the patient's from. Because they might not have a heart made too. They could have one of the other type of VADs that we don't have here in Virginia or, you know, Centera. So with that, we would need you to talk to directly to the center that can better help you. One last thing, there's, well, maybe not one last thing, but another thought. There's, there's a time when a patient is just dead, yeah. and we would yes. pronounce that patient. Right. And I've had EMS people tell me, dead is dead, and I know when they're dead. And of course you do. So if you get on the scene, they've called 911, patient's house. You get there, the patient's cold, they're blue. Rigor mortis is set in. They, you know, blown pupils, all those things that you normally would look for, then that's, you know, something we're not going to be able to fix. Is it possible to have a patient whose pump is still functioning yes. that is dead? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then would we, you would yes, help us? Then you would call us and we would walk you through turning off the pump. Yeah. Now, to the patient that hopefully isn't dead and right. everything's <laughs> functioning correctly, um, how are we going to know that the pump is functioning adequately for the patient um, if we don't have a pulse and we don't, we're not going to be able to assess blood pressure with the equipment that we have pre-hospitally because we don't have a Doppler, um, how are we going to know that the patient is perfusing adequately? Well, you're going to look at the patient just like you normally would. I mean, good cap refill, they're warm, the extremities are warm. Those kind of things are what you're going to look at first. Um, and also, if you can get them hooked to their power base unit, if you have access to that okay. with their screen, then that's going to tell you what their flows are, what their speed is. Um, what their pump wattage is, all those parameters that we're looking at constantly at the hospital, you will have access to. Okay. So that you can call us and be on the phone with us and tell us this is what I'm seeing. Patient's warm, they are, they've had a sinkable episode, they're down, but this is what I'm seeing on my screen. The pump is on, the flows are 6.5, which is their normal. You can report all those things to us so that we can 
Okay. And, and one of the most common reasons that have a syncopal episode is dehydration. So this person is not fluid restricted that we can go ahead and start an IV and it's not like our heart failure patients traditionally where we have to make sure we're not giving them any kind of additional right. fluid. Right. This patient can take fluid can boluses. Can take the fluids and, because the pump is working. Okay. Now you do have the, I have to say, you do have the random patients out there that maybe they're not taking their diuretic appropriately and they'll come into the hospital with three plus edema in the extremities, you know, those kind of things where we're having to monitor that fluid restrict their sodiums down to 129 but those are things we can do as an inpatient right now what you want to do is get a line and get some fluid started and then we can monitor so it wouldn't be beyond the realm of possibility that when we p place these patients on a monitor that they could be in any rhythm in a Brady any rhythm, any rhythm because mm -hmm. of the dehydration yes exactly and a lot of them have chronic atrial fib flutter so they still have their atrial fib flutter and that might be what you see on the screen when you hook them up is the atrial fib flutter I, I overheard you um, when you were having a conversation with someone in there say that you wanted to draw more attention or, or bring a point out that maybe we missed uh, during the lecture series of this about pulmonary hypertension with these patients. Yes, and the majority of them will have some type of pulmonary hypertension at the point of implanting this VAD um, to the point that we do nitric oxide studies on them. Uh, milrinone, dibutamine to review those pressures, to reduce those pressures in the lung before we can even list them for transplant. Because think about putting a normal size heart in a patient that has great or high pulmonary pressures. Then that right heart is just going to dilate out because it's not used to pumping right. against those. We use sildenafil. Most of the patients are home on sildenafil, which is Viagra, Revadio, the other names for them. High doses, 60 milligrams three times a day to 80 milligrams three times a day. So most of the patients are on that. We monitor their right heart caths and their echoes if they're on the list at least monthly, looking at all their pressures. Okay. Now once we're assessing the patient and we've handled whatever the, the easy the problems initial. are, the mm -hmm. syncopal episode, we're giving them a fluid. If their alarms start going off, can you go over the types of alarms that are critical alarms that we may need to interface with immediately. immediately. And that would be that red heart alarm. So you have the controller and this heart here is now red and it is flashing and it is loud. Okay. It's a loud alarm. It's going to get your attention to say stop what you're doing. I need you to problem solve now. So that would be the worst alarm and that would simply mean to you low flow where their flow, if you hooked them up to the screen, would be less than 2.5 liters. Okay. And most of the time, they're at four to six, seven liters, normally, the average. Or it could be pump disconnected. So driveline is, what for whatever reason, and it's very hard and difficult to get the driveline out, but patients have hooked themselves on things with their drivelines. They've hooked themselves on doorknobs and pulled on things where the alarm could be from that. So you would make sure that this was connected and that they're connected to their power, their battery clips or their power base unit, um, or a pump stop. So those would be the main three things for that red heart alarm. If that pump is stopped, it's going to alarm, and it's only going to let you silence the alarm for two minutes, and it's going to keep on alarming until you figure out what's wrong with the red heart and get it fixed. Let me ask you a question about the pump stops. The pump stops and they get the red alarm and they're home alone or they're home with their caregiver. What kind of time frame do they have until they have failure? Failure itself? Um, it's very dependent on the patient, of course, and what caused the red heart alarm. If it's the controller itself, something's wrong with this because it's mechanical, it's electrical. So this controller can go out at any point in time. All patients have a second controller at home with them that's set to their parameters, their pump speeds, their RPMs, they're all set. So if it's a controller issue, and if the red heart alarm is continuing to go off, they're, they've, they've, they're home alone, they're drinking fluids, they've checked connections. If they're on batteries, then we instruct them to go to their power base unit, their wall unit. If they're on wall and this is still going off, transfer to batteries in case it's a connection with the power base unit. So they know they need to, to do the electrical things first. If nothing works and they still have the red heart alarm, then we will take the extra controller out of the bag, hook that to power, and transfer their drive line from their controller they're on to the new controller to see if that fixes the problem.
And if that fixes the problem, that's an urgent situation for them. They still need Thanks. to seek treatment, yes, treatment so that they have a spare exactly. at that point. Come, come back to us so we can look at to see what caused it, whether it's something just with the controller, power, malfunction, and then we have to give them a new backup controller. If it's the pump itself that's malfunctioning, of course you have to get them to us quickly. Um, and the question about how much time do they have, it's dependent on where the patient is at that point in time. The ejection fractions of these patients when we implant the pump is usually anywhere from 5 to 10 percent ejection fraction, the pumping action. They could be a little bit better six months, nine months down the road. We've given the heart a rest. Mm -hmm. We're actually doing the pumping for it. So if their ejection fraction has now gone to 30, 35 percent, then they might have 15 minutes before they become sinkable, lightheaded, dizzy, and go out. If their ejection fraction is still and they're completely dependent on this pump, then it could be immediate. If this pump stops, raw eyes roll back in the head and they're out. So okay. it's very dependent on where they are. Okay. Brenda, is there a, I know if you're getting a heart transplant, there's a, there's a certain standard that you have to meet. These patients that have these, are they, they can be all kinds of all poor kinds health. Of so this is not necessarily yes. a healthy person who gets this or somebody who's going to be a, a good candidate for a transplant or is it a good candidate for a transplant? Well, there, there are parameters. For a transplantation at Norfolk, we transplant between 15 and 68 years old. So say you have that 69-year-old that comes into the ED with fulminant heart failure, but their other organs are good, they're active out in the community, they're doing things, they're playing golf, they're fishing, they're just out there, but all they have is heart failure. Then we would do an evaluation for them for destination therapy, DT therapy. So that would be the patient that, for other reasons, can't have a heart transplant, but just needs a support for their left ventricle. And they can have many more years of life with the, the left ventricle support. Do we have any idea what this, I mean, a heart, heart transplant, what do they say, 10 years, something like that? Oh, what, no. Do we know what about, what um, about the it is with for these? Our, for our hearts right now, probably in the range of 13, 12, 13 to 20 years. We've got oh, wow. some okay. patients 20 years out. Right now we have a patient that's out on this four and a half years. Thoratec thinks this is a very durable pump from what we've seen, it is, and it could be five to ten years before they have actual problems with the pump itself. So the patient's destination therapy could be out there five, ten years, and then have issues with the pump where they would either need a replacement or it could be end of life. So we do discuss that with the initial evaluation. Where do you want to go with this? At the point of having, say, a big stroke, do you want to be in a nursing home with a pump that's working, but you're brain dead? I mean, you're a vegetative right, state. Um, we would turn the pump off at that time. So we have that conversation. It's a hard conversation oh, to have right. with patients, but it has to be done. Where do you want to go with this if this scenario happens? So is it possible to see a patient that has this that has a DNR? Yes. If okay. they're destination therapy, then they could very well have a DNR status. Now, with the destination therapy patients, how many patients are out there in our community who have that in place? Um, right now, in the Virginia Beach area, we probably have about 10 to 12 of our patients. And in the Hampton Roads area? In the Hampton Roads, over 40. Oh, okay. Wow. Yes. And how many are you doing annually? Last year, 48. This year, we've done 25 so far. Wow, and it's only June. Yes. End of June. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of patients. Yes, so patients. we're going to be seeing these. More and more. And then we you see, we'll see also them. see more because a resort area that right. we're going to have exactly. patients coming in. From all over the place. And these patients, the goal is to go home. Average length of stay, 12 to 18 days post-implant. Really? Now, so but at that point, home. are they very comfortable with the device or are they going to call us because they're uncomfortable with maintaining the device? Maintaining the device, not so much because they have so much training before we even allow them to go home. Where your calls are going to come are going to be the dehydration type of... That they just aren't used yes, to not being on fluid restriction yes, anymore? Yes, exactly, and making them eat salt. You know, I tell my patients, you can have some pizza, you can have some Chinese, that bag of potato chips you've been wanting, eat it. And they look at me like I've got horns in my head. Right. Are you crazy, woman? Um, so once they get through that initial couple of weeks at home and they realize I do have to drink or I'm not going to feel good, I do have to eat salt, I'm just not going to feel good, then they're flying. Most of them are flying from them. Then on. For most of the patients, if we get called, the expectation is, is that we will transport these patients, I would imagine. Um, will there be any cases that 
consulting with you that will be able to say this patient can stay at home, we just fixed their problem, and that they can, can be transported on their own? Mm -hmm. There would be, especially if it's something to do with just dehydration. Um, because if we can get some Gatorade in them or if we can just get a line and get 500 cc's of normal saline, then they could just perk right up if that's the only issue. And then they could come into clinic the next day on their own instead of being transported. If we are transporting them, where do they need to go? Where's the priority hospital for them to go? The best place to send them would be the place that has the expertise in the VADs and the VAD equipment that we can check out, which would be Centera Norfolk for our area. If it was an, uh, a VAD patient who has the bad luck to twist their ankle, can a, another hospital take that patient? They can. They can. If that's the only thing that's wrong, then they can certainly go to that center and be stabilized with an ankle or um, you know, a fluid bolus. Okay. If there's any issue at all with alarms and equipment, they really need to come to us so that we can analyze what's wrong with the controller, you know, do a complete analysis of where they've been with their flows and their power wattage and all those that kind of things that we're looking at. And the, uh, the only hospital locally that has the equipment to be able to do that diagnostic is Norfolk General, it's correct? Norfolk General. And yes. you have all the backup equipment. Yes. What if the, the patient self-reports to another hospital because it's closer to them and they need to be transported out? Is there anybody who has backup equipment that you know, they have a controller issue, they have battery issues, they have some kind of an issue. Is there somebody that, that we can contact to get backup equipment? Um, MTI, the medical transport for Sentara, now has some backup equipment for that reason. If something were to happen equipment-wise, they've got three sets of equipment to go to different regions of okay. the Hampton Roads area to help with that kind of transport. So we were talking about if a patient has to change out their controller, and the probably the most critical part of this, if they're changing their controller, is to make sure that the other one is powered up and ready to go yes. before they actually disconnect the drive. Yes. Crucial words. Because you're going to take the second controller, their backup controller, and we're going to hook that to power, whether it be batteries or their power base unit, depending on what they're on, and making sure the green light that's telling us that we've got power to both leads is on. So we know that this controller is working before we actually do any transfer. Once we've done that, then we can set the two controllers side by side. We can open their safety latch here on both controllers, and then we're gonna take the controller from their controller that they're on, depress here, pull it out straight, and then stick it right back into their other. This one's going to alarm because, because we've disconnected it. and it's going to do that alarm saying, oh my God, you took, you took, you know, you're disconnected. But ignore that one until we've got everything connected here and patient and patients working and stable. And then okay. we can disconnect from this side. And with power being such a huge issue with these units in an area that we live where we have hurricanes, we have thunderstorms and the power goes out. I know that you said that generator wasn't optimum, but there's times when that's the only power there is. So they should go to a shelter that has the ability to have power. They should seek some, go to the hospital, get some assistance some way so that they can some be powered way. on. And um, they should be looking at that at the, at the time they're sent home. Where is their nearest community shelter um, with a wall generator? Because we know with the, like the little Home Depot, Lowe's type of generators, they have power surges. And with those power surges, we don't know, and Thoratec doesn't know for sure, what it might do to the microprocessors in their controller. So we want them to either have their own mm -hmm. wall generator, which are, we know that are very expensive, mm -hmm. or they can find out where they need to go as far as hooking up. Um, of course, the EDs will have the red plugs for emergency power, but you can't have 50 patients going to somebody's emergency room. They would be calling us and saying, what have you done? Mm -hmm. um, so looking at um, nursing homes, most of them have the red plugs and the generators, wall generators. Um, fire stations, some of the fire stations mm -hmm. have some mm -hmm. generators, um, you know, for temporary, just temporary. They also have, the patients will have an emergency power pack at home. Now this emergency power pack gives them 12 hours of power. They, it's like a little mini generator a in a box. A mini generator with the same, as you can see, 
white and black connectors that we have to our controller here. They also have eight batteries that are eight to 12 hours each. But it takes so two at a time? Takes two at a time. Okay. So they have that. So they literally have probably 24 to 36 hours of backup power with their batteries in this. Provided that everything's charged when yes, the power goes out. Yes, <laughs> patients need to keep everything charged. <laughs> Having said that, um, so they've got 20, at least 24 hours, supposedly. With that, so if it's in a, a, a random thunderstorm, then you know usually it's two or three hours and the power's back on. If it's a hurricane where there's trees down, that could be our real issue. In that state, we would tell patients, go ahead and get out of the area. If we think there's going to be a direct hit with a hurricane, you just need to go ahead and make your plans to get out of this area. Other we don't than know the how equipment long. that they have, which if you plug that into your monitor, you get a lot of data from right. that. Other than that, do they have something that tells a story about them so that if they do go out of the area, somebody might be able to take care of them? Yes, because they have their little cards with all the information on it, what type of VAD they have, what their settings are. They have that. They also have a three-ring binder. All my patients go home with a three-ring binder that has a daily log sheet. And on that daily log sheet, they they are supposed to each morning put their speed down, what their flows have been, their map blood pressures, all that's supposed to be in a handy place for them so they've got trends of where they are. So whether they're going out of town to avoid a hurricane or whether we're transporting them to the hospital, we should bring all that with we us, correct? With what them. else should we bring? Obviously we need to bring extra batteries in Extra case. batteries. The power base unit, they, you need the power base unit and the screen because it does have a 12 volt adapter plug. So we can plug it into a cigarette lighter. plug into a cigarette lighter or an inverter if you have those on your units. It has 20, for, 20 foot of cord, so you can even plug it in up front, take it back to the patient and have them plug into it. And that way you have got a screen with all their numbers. So you can be literally on the phone with us saying the flow is now less than 2.5. We've got a red heart alarm, but the pump is working. What are we going to tell you? Make sure you got a line in, get some fluid started. It could just simply be low flow. Um, so we can help with that troubleshooting and diagnosis of what's going on. Now, if we're not at their house where their power base unit would be, and they're out and about and they have their go bag with them, what supplies will they have with them in their go bag? They're going to have, now this is the go bag, the extra go bag. This is the one that they have on them. So the one they have on them will simply have their controller with their batteries. Just the one controller? The one controller. And such as batteries. this. Okay. And it won't always look like that? No, it might not, because they might just have a fanny pack. Okay. But if they have a fanny pack, then the controllers in the fanny pack and the batteries are worn on their belt. And some of the patients that we saw, it was not obvious that they no. had any, any... Most of the patients will try to disguise <laughs> that they have anything. So they will have shirts over it or sweaters. There is also a very nice custom vest that some patients have and that you cannot tell with those patients that they have a heart made too or any type of that. There, so we should do a quick assessment for all our cardiac yes. arrest patients to make sure there's not any wires not coming out of wires that. wires coming out. Their extra bag, which they're okay. supposed, anytime they go anywhere they're supposed to take with them, will have a pouch and of course the extra controller will be in that front pouch and then you will have extra batteries and extra clips. Usually they have the emergency clinician's guide for, and guide for patients for alarms in the bag. And then they will have their card that states which transplant center or VAD center that they are um, with and the numbers and all the emergency And that's pretty and consistent whether that's they were consistent. transplanted at Norfolk General or yes. at another hospital. This is consistent with nationwide with where the patients are. So in summary, if we were to tell people the, the, the main things that they should be concerned about, obviously power, power. making sure it's plugged in, mm -hmm. protecting that drive Driving. line, mm -hmm. being very cautious about how we do CPR. Or not with, doing CPR. Or not, not, not doing, doing CPR. CPR. Until you talk to us, correct? And to be, be alert that you can have a patient who's conscious, alert, speaking to you with no pulse. In VTAC, VFib. In VTAC or VFib. Yes. Okay, and so you might basically not have to do treat anything. your patient. Treat your patient. Treat the symptoms. And call you. I call us. <laughs> yes. Call us. Right, thank you so much. This thank is very valuable welcome. information. We really welcome. appreciate you bringing it to us. Thank you. You're welcome.